Buju, Anin, and Tansy. Welcome. Boy, oh boy, we're having a great time today. I'm Jerry the Big Bear Barrett, and I will be your host through the afternoon, and uh, I am learning so much today. It's great to see so much of our culture being shared and everything from fitness to uh, cuisine and uh, some big topics, of course, and uh, welcome to all our delegates, all our viewers out there, and uh, we definitely hope that you're enjoying uh, what our presentations so far during the conference. Coming up next, we have decolonizing and indigenizing curriculum through land-based education. It's a big topic. I'm looking forward to it. And joining us today is Tanya McCallum. Tanya is a uh, kindergarten to grade 12 teacher from Pelican Narrows, Saskatchewan. The name of her community in the Cree language is Wap Wapawo Sikanik. Wapawo Sikanik. Means narrows of fear. Yes. She is a proud member of the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation Treaty 6 uh, territory. Tanya obtained a master's degree in land-based education from the University of Saskatchewan in 2020. In 2007, she graduated with a Bachelor of Education degree from Gabriel Dumont Institute, a SUNTEP program with great distinction and a major in Indigenous Studies. In 1997, she completed certificates in forestry, fisheries, and wildlife, and a diploma in integrated resource management program. She has been busy, busy as a beaver. Please make welcome to our conference, Tanya McCallum. Tanya? Hi, Tanya McCallum, and this is the Gasson, who is the Gani Wutse. I think it's going to be a good thing. Hi, my name is Tanya McCallum. I am from Pelican Arrow, Saskatchewan, which is uh, Northern Saskatchewan. I currently work in, uh, I'm a woodland Cree, and I currently work with Plains Cree uh, culture, a community called Sturgeon Lake Central School, uh, K to 12, and it's a First Nation school. And I've been teaching land-based for uh, about five years now. Prior to that, I was a math and science teacher at this school. And a lot of my, um, my lessons were already out on the land before I even got the title. And um, yeah, so that's my intro. If you would like to put on the first slide. So the land, uh, the land is a key aspect of who I am. Where I come from, um, the, just wait, I gotta take myself out here. So um, those pictures is, was my playground growing up. The first uh, form of education that I obtained is informal education with uh, uh, my grandparents had raised me. I was very fortunate to have been raised by my grandparents who were hunters, fishers, and trappers. Uh, so the first form of education, like I said, um, that I had is informal education. And, uh, you know, right in the center of the, the boreal forest of the Canadian Shield, uh, those beautiful pictures you see there, that, that was my playground. So all the skills that I obtained throughout the years were passed on by my grandparents. And now I pass on to my, my two daughters and my students. So yep, the, uh, the land is a key aspect of who I am. Next slide. So today I'm gonna to be talking about um, uh, decolonizing and indigenizing um, curriculum, uh, what I've done. And um, I could talk about it for hours, but I'm just gonna show some of the things that I've done. It's only a 45 minute presentation. Um, I, I have videos, I have, I have tons of things that I could have shared with you. But when we talk about um, uh, in education, you know, traditionally the Cree youth, like we've all learned um, from our families, from knowledge keepers, from our elders uh, while living on the land. As hunters, trappers and gatherers, we needed to learn skills necessary to survive out on the land. Hunting, trapping, sewing, cooking, uh, we learn these skills as part of as as part of life out on the land. So, um, not only bringing all the the academic education that I have, it's experiences that I've had um, out on the land is what I bring. And then when we look at our curriculums, um, like it varies from province to province. Like um, so, what I do with my land-based education is um, I try and indigenize our. Uh, the, uh, the Saskatchewan curriculum, which is the province that I am. 
um, decolonizing the curriculum by indigenizing it with uh, land-based teachings. So, um, so yeah, so that's all I'll be talking about. And so I've been doing land-based for the past four or five years. But like I said, prior to this, I was a math and science teacher for a number of years. I used a lot of land-based lessons and the kids just loved my lessons. They got a lot out of math and science because we were always out on the land. But the thing with that is it just seemed like um, a lot of times educators take the, the existing uh, Saskatchewan mandated curriculums as gospel. You know, it's like, oh, I got to teach by this. I got to take these outcomes and these indicators and, and so on. But sometimes we need to, um, especially in today's society, we need to uh, get back to our, our traditional ways. We, uh, we are losing touch with our culture in many of our schools. And we are so, our students are so disconnected with the land. So um, here's a quote by Dr. Alex Wilson from Opaskwaya Cree Nation. I'm sure some of you have probably heard about her. She was she spearheaded the Indigenous land-based ed, uh, master's education program that I, I graduated from. So no matter how dominant an ideology is, there are always other ways of interpreting the world and how we teach from that frame of thought. Colonialism has tried to maintain a singular social order through law and policies suppressing the indigenous ways of knowing and connections to the environment. Uh, next slide. So this is my philosophy of education uh, um, from a land-based uh, point of view. Our cultures, languages, and epistemologies are rooted in the lands we occupy. We must take schooling out on the land so that youth can become connected to who they are while learning Every, every best that education has to offer. All students are unique and needs come to school with their own knowledge and skill sets. They have dreams, talents, and interests. As a teacher, my role is to help build on their strengths so they can become independent thinkers through land-based education. The land is the teacher and the healer. I develop uh, activities for mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical development with links to family, community, and nation. I want my students to make connections with the world around them and be open-minded. Community involvement is an essential aspect of land-based education. It is the elders, hunters, trappers, fishers, and gatherers of medicines and foods that are teachers of indigenous education in Northern Saskatchewan. And I'm sure it's the same way uh, province-wide or country-wide. Next slide. So, um, Land-based education, outdoor education, what's the difference? So urban schools offer outdoor education. So when land-based first came out, uh, um, you know, it, it wasn't valued. Like, for, like I said, when, um, because people don't really understand the true term of what land-based education is, people just think it's just, oh, it's, a, it's just another outdoor trip, but there's a lot more to it. Um, so um, when I was doing my math, my math and science for you know all all those number of years it just felt like I always had to justify why I'm going on a field trip so I had to run to the curriculum and find which outcome and which indicator and there was always something in there uh, and that that would be the only way uh, to justify my trip otherwise you know, parents or or some admin thought oh they you know they, they just want to be out there but it's not Everything we did, there was always a lesson. So, um, so it's not just an outdoor program. You know, land-based education can take place in the classroom, can take place virtually. So, um, so land-based education um, stresses on the, that in how indigenous people are have that close connection to the land. Um, it's passing on knowledge from family, elders and knowledge keepers. It means living in harmony with the environment, respecting animals and taking what, what, only what we need. Land-based learning is a way that knowledge is transferred from one generation to the next. Like I said, uh, land-based education has been here um, from the beginning of time. Indigenous people have always had STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, math. We've always had that. How do you think we, we've thrived, we've survived all these 10,000s of years? So people think that land-based education is a trend 
it's not a trend. It, it's always been here. That's just our way of life as, as indigenous people. So a land-based uh, land approach, land-based learning typically uses indigenous indigenized and environmentally focused approach to education by recognizing the deep, the phys physical, spiritual, and men men spiritual mental connection that we as indigenous people have with the land. So that's the big difference. It's, it's land-based education is ties in with culture, ties in with language, and it, it's not just an outdoor program. Next slide. So in order for uh, land-based education to be, um, you know, it uh, to be, I'm gonna kind of go back again to what I just shared. So it recognizes the strong connection indigenous people have with the, la with the lands and the territories that they occupy. Indigenous people have a profound relationship with the land. It is a model of education that allows students to learn and connect with the land. It is an approach to teaching and learning that relies on the balance of indigenous ways of knowing and the core, sub, the, the core school subjects. It allows, students an op, it, it allows students an opportunity to develop an interdependent worldview while engaging in activities for mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical growth. Indigenous knowledge is deeply embedded in our worldviews and relationship to the natural world as well as cultural practices. It is the foundation for cultural identity and language development. It is the key to learning environmental stewardship, sustainable ways of thinking and being. In addition, it responds to the environmental changes and contemporary issues such as climate change and the pandemic that we are facing. Indigenous people have drawn to their traditional knowledges. Okay, every year the community of Sturgeon Lake has a culture camp. But since COVID hit, we couldn't have that big gathering. So, but it did not stop us from, um, from having a camp. Uh, we switched it over to, um, from a culture camp. We called it Harvest Days. So what we did is we had a bunch of people. It, we, had, we got a bunch of people to, of the community to go hunt uh, and gather foods. And then we brought them back and we showed that students, um, we still have our cultural, but we called it harvest days. So we prepped all this fish, all this meat, all these berries, all these medicines. And we just, uh, we just um, got them ready because the pandemic was, was going to peak. And that is exactly what we did. When, when it did peak back in December and there was the, the Delta, I think was the worst one. Uh, we had our traditional foods. We, we, we were feeding the, the people of the community. Uh, we had a pandemic medicine. We had a, a, the healing lodge had traditional medicines where the local people came uh, to rather than um, getting medicines from pharmacies that weren't working. So uh, we switched it over and also about climate change. The community I work with are very big on, on climate, climate change education because they see the elders see um, the changes that are already happening. So they, they want the kids to be, um, uh, to know about climate change and its effect because it, it affects our way of life as indigenous people. You could change the slide. So, uh, so what needs to unfold for land-based education to be effective and successful? You need a strong involvement and in school community and you need a, an administration uh, administration to be very supportive. Uh, again, uh, they need to know what exactly is land-based education. Otherwise, it's just another outdoor activity. And you know, uh, many times uh, teachers always focus on numeracy and literacy. Numeracy and literacy. You know, I've had teachers that tell me, "Well, you know, these three kids are weak. I need to bring them up to speed." So no land base for them today, you know, and that just breaks my heart because formal education isn't for everybody. And I know math, numeracy and literacy are important, but those are also skills you can learn out on the land and the students will probably get more out of learning from the land than they would sitting in the classroom for seven hours a day. So professional development on the integration of land-based education, uh, PD days, indigenous materials and resources for teachers. A lot of the things um, that, that I use for my teachings is even if you look around my classroom, you know, I didn't have to go buy these pelts. 
in a in the teacher store. Uh, I have beehives. I have um, antlers. I have uh, a lot of things get donated to my classroom and like jaws of a. Uh, of, of animals or bones and uh, those are my teaching tools you know a lot of the my teaching resources come from the land the the, the medicines we harvest the trees I, I bring I, I bring a lot of the land into the, my classroom teachings so access to land lakes rivers hunting fishing and ceremonial sites so um, so those are my classrooms often you'll see me take one day out of the week and you see me go um, go around the community or you know within that one hour radius from here and looking for where my next classroom is going to be, where my next teaching is going to be. And a lot of those are the lakes, the land, uh, the rivers, uh, ceremonial sites, you know, cultural grounds or fish camps or even go visit the trapper. And uh, so access to the land, elder guidance um, to cultural protocols, uh, elders are a must when it comes to land-based education and also another um, knowledge keepers because anybody can be a knowledge keeper for example we have culture days right now I have my daughter she's 13 years old she's an archer um, she's she's here right now and she's teaching these little ones they're learning from a child uh, with um, with, with her archery skills. So knowledge keepers doesn't necessarily mean it has to be an elder. And, and then I have another daughter, she's 24 years old. Uh, she's a hunter. So often uh, she shows kids how to, um, to cut meat and, and so on. So knowledge keepers, everybody has knowledge keepers in their community. You just need to find them. So indigenous ways of knowing are epistemologies, indigenous ontologies, methodologies, and pedagogies knowledge of social, historical, economic, political, and cultural realities of First Nations people in Canada, seasonal, cycle, and cultural activities. So that's what needs to unfold for land-based education to be effective because a lot of people, there's a lot of land-based going on the past few years in schools. And a lot of people um, come to me for, you know, what makes your, your program so effective? You know, why, and, and so on. So. I do a presentation with them, such as what I'm gonna do here. And also um, you just, uh, there's gotta be an objective because a lot of times I went to this one school and the teacher goes, uh, actually that men called me in to do a presentation to the staff. And they said, you know, we have a land-based teacher but our kids are not engaged there and so on. So after talking to the land-based teacher and some of the teachers, so what I found was, uh, the land-based teacher was just using the land-based as, okay, we're going to go snowshoeing today, but there's no objective, you know, um, who used snowshoes, uh, why are snowshoes used, what materials are used, you have to give those students objectives, your own objectives, not necessarily from the curriculum you're teaching from, but uh, objectives from an Indigenous point of view, you know, those snowshoes were used by our people for tens of thousands of years. Why? You tell them why. So once the students know why they're going on the field trip, why they're gonna come learn about furs, why they're gonna go pick medicines, trust me, they'll be, uh, in, they'll be engaged, but you need to have objectives all the time. You could change the slide. So uh, how am I, um, what I do is um, I look at the curriculums, for example, if you could see, I could show you these here. So how I uh, try to decolonize our, our curriculum is, our curriculums, our mandated curriculums that we teach, they'll always be here. That's what we're expected to teach. And then, but in a First Nation school, there's ways you can decolonize and uh, indigenize those curriculums. For example, I print out, I have this, Saskatchewan science curriculum, grades one to 12, these are the core, you, core units. So what I do is I ask the teachers, you know, what units are, will you be teaching in the next couple of months? So uh, the teachers know um, what they're teaching. They come and let me know and they say, you know, I'm, my grade tens are doing environmental science. Uh, these are the objectives. How can you land, do a land-based lessons on there? or also uh, grade sevens, interactions with ecosystems. So I, I, I keep a um, good collaboration with the teachers 
And then, so, you know, they do their curriculum part and I come in and try and decolonize some of the way they're teaching by indigenizing the curriculum. So that's how it runs at our school here. And it's been four or five years um, for, and then another one is the plants that the, the grade three teacher is learning about plants. So um, she comes to me and then, so we just planted tobacco pretty soon when we're gonna start harvesting plants too. So that's how um, the curriculum and how my year plan run works is I have a seasonal year plan. And, you know, because difference in indigenous country, different seasons comes with different teachings. So I have a seasonal year plan. Sometimes I don't hit everything just like everybody's uh, year plan um, from the curriculum. Sometimes, and things are always subject to change. So um, seasonal cycle cultural activities, teaching knowledge of parental, provincial curriculum outcomes, on land excursions, field trips and experiential activities. Uh, I'll show you uh, pictures of those along the way. And so it's formal education versus informal learning. Take lessons outside the formal setting where the land becomes your classroom. Student engagement, participation, and indirect learning. Learning objectives. What do you want your students to walk away with? Uh, Project-based teaching and learning that benefits the community. Um, yeah, so uh, land-based education also is about reciprocity. You know, you're, you're doing things, you're giving back to the community, whether you're, you're harvesting medicines for the healing lodges or for the elders, or um, we've planted gardens. We're gonna be planting gardens here pretty quick for a, a el elderly that can no longer do that. Um, just st stuff like that. So it's about reciprocity. Learning centered and uh, child focused. Uh, when we talk about learner centered, sometimes um, I'm a woodland Cree and I'm teaching in a Plains Cree community. So sometimes what happens is we don't have sweet grass where I come from. We don't have sage where I come from. So when I take kids out to go pick medicines, you know, you ask those students. I remember one time I, I asked a group of kids, I said, who here knows how what sweet grass looks like? Believe it or not, this one little grade one boy, and how old are you when you're in grade one? Six? Grade one boy says, uh, they're green and they're long, and in the bottom, it looks a little purple. So that kid taught the class at how to pick sweetgrass, what sweetgrass looks like. It was unbelievable. So when I talk about learner-centered, you know, get the kids, ask the kids, because the kids know a lot, but they won't say a lot because, with formal education, is the teacher is the center. The teacher is the one that's teaching all the time. Use your students as uh, little teachers because they 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 bring a lot to to school. You just and, and it's empowering for them. And uh, build relationship with participants and communities. Network and other land based teachers. The land is a part of who we are. Uh, you can change the slide. So with land-based education, um, there was very there was there wasn't a lot of outdoor excursions prior to my land-based education because, like I said, a lot of these teachers, a lot of the not only these, but a lot of teachers, um, especially the new teachers when they come out, they think they just have to be in the formal education. That's what they teach us when we graduate from our from from teaching programs is you got to teach from the curriculum. You got to follow, 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 follow. Um, so it's always formal education. It's always classroom based. But what I found these past few years is take kids out on the land. You know, uh, like I said, collaborate with other, with what the Cree teacher is teaching or the language teacher or the phys ed teacher. So take kids out on the land. Trust me, it's it's uh, they'll learn a lot. It's always it's even even going for a simple hike. It's not about when we go for a hike, we're identifying trees. Uh, we're talking about medicines. We're talking about um, taking care of the land and so on. So um, land based education can go on, can happen both um, in the classroom but it's even more effective if you take kids out on the land and they love it, they love it. You know, I'll be, I'll be walking down the classroom and the classroom door is open and if I stop 
and say hi to the kids, the first thing they'll say is, hey, where are we going today? What are we learning about? Or they'll say, hey, let's, let's go catch a beaver today and so on, because they remember those teachings. And another time too, I was this past fall, actually, I, was, I went on a field trip with students. And so this kid is in grade seven. So he would have been in grade two, probably when I started. So we're, I was sitting in the bus with him and he started talking about, hey, remember, I remember all the trips you took me. And he started naming all the trips and what we did on those trips. And I thought, to my, well, after reflecting on my day, I thought to myself, wow, wow. I wonder if this kid could tell me what he learned in the classroom all those years. But he remembered vividly all the trips, his favorite trips and what he did on that trips. So, you know, make those trips meaningful for the kids to, to enjoy themselves. Next slide. Okay, so part of taking kids out, out on the land is um, you're tying the students back to their culture. You know, a lot of our kids, um, sadly, don't know, um, don't know who they are as, a, as, a, as plain screen people because, well, we all know why, the residential school systems. Um, but I'm not gonna waste my time talking about that because we all know the impact it had and the interge intergenerational trauma it caused. So part of land-based education is tying those students back to the classroom um, and then, then you know, identity, who, who they are. So in some of these pictures, you'll see um, kids cutting, cutting meat, you know, um, we don't want to do camps around here, you know, find other camps that you, that you could take your students to, you know, do a culture exchange, change, go, go visit a Dene culture day, go woodland culture day, go and, uh, you know, learn about other cultures, learn from them. Because when I, when I took my master's program, you know, we, we went and stayed with the Hawaiians. I did an international uh, study. We went two weeks, we went and stayed with the indigenous Hawaiians. So we learned about um, how they decolonized and how they in indigenized their program. And then we also went to stay, we went to the Northwest Territories for two weeks. We went and stayed with the Denes up there. Again, we're, we learned about their, their, their indigenous ways. And so we, it's all about um, sharing, sharing knowledge. And um, so culture days and also elders, um, bring in elders to teach to the kids and also take the kids to the elders. Cause sometimes um, when, we, when we talk about elders, sometimes elders are reluctant to come to schools because a lot of our schools are still so like um, their, their Western worldviews, you know, the, just the way they're set up. And sometimes with the residential school systems, uh, thinking about the residential school, sometimes a lot of our elders, the triggers are there, you know, so sometimes it's good to take the kids to the elders. Okay, um, next slide. So, um, so along the way, like the school that I work at, their climate change is a big thing, because, um, like I said, it affects our indigenous, uh, our traditional ways, it, it's affecting our medicines. You know, if our, if our, if our medicines are sick, then uh, we can't rely on them to, to get better. If our waters are sick, then we can't eat the fish out of there. If our, if our, um, and so on, you know, our animals, if our animals, you know, it's science shows that, uh, research shows that our animals are um, being affected by climate change. Uh, you know, we have chronic wasting disease, we have uh, tick infestations, you know, we have, we, around here this past winter, we had tons and tons of snow, and that a lot of our animals, especially our big game animals, didn't make it. You, you, you've seen, you, you've seen a lot of dead, dead moose and dead deer, and it, it's so unfortunate, and, and that's, you know, uh, with climate change, it's that one extreme weather to the next and this year it was a, a really cold winter for us the snow was very deep it was hard for the for the animals to forage and um, to get around so they, 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 they died of starvation and so with land-based education it raises 
environmental awareness, educate the, the, the students about resource extracts and renew, renewable, what's renewable and what's non-renewable resources, pollution, reduce, reuse, recycle. You know, uh, when I used to do, ha, teach my science class with the middle years, we always visited our landfill, you know, this, our local landfill, our city landfill, not just to visit it, but what kind of garbage we generate, you know, do we, do we need to be using so much styrofoam? Do we need to be, uh, you know, um, reusing, recycling stuff, you know, go visit Sarkan um, and so on. So with this, with my land-based program, I notice, uh, you know, you'll see kids starting to um, pick up garbage or, or um, I'll give you an example. This one time I took kid, um, when we started ice fishing, these kids have never ice fished, let alone set a net out on the lake. So anyway, we were we started ice fishing, and again, these boys were in grade one or grade two at the time. These two little boys. So we started pulling out the fish. Oh, did they ever enjoy themselves? And then and then um, and then they said. And then I heard that one little boy talking to that other little boy, and he's like, Skyler, he said, I'm never gonna pee in the water again. And then I looked at him and I said, Blake, why not? Because there's fish in there. There's little critters there that because I do aquatic diversity too, because there's little critters in there that the fish eat. And if you pee in there or throw garbage, then it's not good for the fish. You know, that's what land-based education is about, you know, environmental stewardship. So that, you know, get them while they're young. Uh, next slide. So um, utilize your elders. Utilize your elders, invite elders, take your students to elders. I've already said that. Their traditional knowledge has a role with land-based education. The knowledge keepers have a lifetime of experience living close to the land. Okay, when I take, um, when I take kids to go, talk to, to go talk to an elder, like I said, give those kids an objective. Uh, you know, give them, guide them as to what they want, what kind of knowledge they want after those, from those elders. And what I always tell my, my students is, my land-based kids is, or even my, my children is, when you start listening to, say you're listening to an elder that's 75 years old, so that's 75 years of knowledge. When that elder starts talking about their grandfather, you're adding another 70 years, that's 140 years of knowledge. When they start talking about their grandfather, their chap and their great-great-grandfather, that's like 500 years of knowledge. So, uh, so they're a library, really, you know, there's a lot of history that goes on there. So our children need to know that they carry a whole lot of knowledge, especially when they start going down, down their, their genealogy, uh, what their great great grandfather taught them. That's knowledge from 500 years ago. They could easily get, access that historical knowledge by visiting an elder without having to go to um, the internet or to the library researching tons of books. So um, a lifetime of education, elders are very valuable. Learning from the, the land gives the students the opportunity to connect and strengthen relationships, the elders and other knowledge keepers of the community. So um, bring, bring elders in. Um, yeah, I could, I could talk a lot about that from my own experience of, um, for example, I'm gonna talk about when I first started teaching, um, I wanted to indigenize uh, the, my social studies. So the first, um, so I picked the first unit I was going to take from the Saskatchewan curriculum, and it was um, interactions, uh, interdependent. It was interdependence, and it was a long unit. And so I was like, okay, um, I am not going to wait till my students are in university to learn about who they are. I'm going to indigenize the social studies curriculum. And you know what? It was, I was so shocked when um, we were, a group of us were talking. And at the time, my first principal, when I started teaching was a non-indigenous man, an older man. And um, he heard us talking and then, and then I mentioned to the other teacher, I said, you know, do you take, do you have to take what you're teaching from the curriculum as gospel? Like, can you switch it up a bit? Right away, that principal approached me and he said, of course you have to take it as gospel. That's what we're paying you for is to teach from that curriculum. So I was just blown away. So I was like, okay. 
So anyway, I wasn't going to listen to him anyway. I was still going to teach from the curriculum, but I was going to indigenize it. So I went to the library and I got, I did my research and I seen that principal walk by me a couple of times, just like, you know, it's like he was spying on me. So anyway, I got my unit ready. And then, um, so anyway, I started teaching. I had a big class. They were great sixes. And I started my unit my very first day. And I remember pulling out a big book. I had a big book like this titled uh, Before the White Man. And you know what? what? As soon as I read that title, Before the White Man, who walks into my classroom? The non-Indigenous principal. Wow, did I ever switch gears on what I was going to talk about. He did not want me teaching Indigenous history. I was just, I thought to my, I went home that day and I thought in this day and age, I could not believe it. I, I, my, my major was Indigenous studies and I wasn't even allowed to teach it. I thought to myself, this has got to change. You know, this has got to change. The same, the same principle I remember, I wanted to bring in an elder from the community. Remember, I wasn't from the community. So I thought, well, I'll go approach the, the principal. Perhaps he has a list of elders for me that I could reach out to. Again, same principle. I said, you know, this is what I'm teaching. I want an elder to come talk to my students. And then he goes, nah, no, no, no. The elders around here, you know, like that's how, that's exactly how he, um, he I, how he responded. And I, again, I walked out and I thought, oh my goodness, in this day and age, I couldn't believe it. Just remember, I've only been teaching 13 years because I had switched careers. I was in the field of environment before. And then I think my first year of teaching is what really pushed me to de start decolonizing these existing curriculums and indigenizing them. So um, next slide, I'm really looking at the time. Next slide. So through land-based, oh, no, I think, okay. So through land-based education, we can indigenize our existing curriculums. So these are some of the, uh, the textbooks that our teachers use. And what I find with these textbooks is, made, um, so the province of Saskatchewan, you know, we've come a long ways trying to indigenize our curriculums, but we're not doing enough. You know, I find the science, the science I, I taught science to grade six, seven, and eight. We, I was the specialized teacher in science. So what are the, the three textbooks that I use? So at the beginning of each chapter, there's a little bio of an elder talking about the, um, the upcoming unit, the, the, the indigenous worldview of the upcoming unit. And then that was it. So that, that wasn't a whole lot. So um, indigenizing these existing curriculums is, is a must when it comes to land-based education and you can do it through land-based education. Next slide. So some of the things that, so how do we fit land-based education into our, our, our existing curriculums? So, um, so the first one is an, analyze natural factors and human practices that affect productivity, uh, marine and freshwater environments. This is kind of messed up here. So examine the ways in which First Nations and Métis people traditionally valued, depended on and cared, cared for aquatic wildlife and plants. So if you go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, take this for example. Um, when I started my land-based program, the first thing that I, I noticed is, well, even my teaching years is, if you show a kid a giraffe, a pig, a monkey, uh, a baboon, you know, they, an elephant, they know all those animals, but <laughs> but if you start the minute I showed the kids what this is or what a bear is, not a clue, not a clue. So why are we teaching our children about exotic animals? or animals that, that they'll never see walking down the road, that they'll never see when we're doing land-based. So they, 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 and so the kids are smart. They know all these uh, animals from, from Africa, but they don't know our, our own species, which is, which is very, very sad. So what I do is, and even uh, goldfish, they'll know what a goldfish is, they'll know what a shark is, a, a megalodon, 
but we only have so many species in our lakes, but you show them arrow species, they'll just say fish, fish, but they'll specifically know what the Nemo is or a Megalodon and all that stuff. So a part of decolonizing is um, start, you don't need to teach children about animals that they'll never see. Start teaching them and giving them uh, figurines like this in Head Start or uh, these with the primary grades, these little figurines that I have, and there's more of them in my classroom, they are a hit to my students. That's the first thing they run to. So now you ask my students, I have videos of them, is what is this? They'll, they'll, they won't only say moose, they'll say moosa, or they'll say elk. At least it's similar to, to what it is. So um, start uh, with the elementary, what I'm doing is indigenizing, starting to decolonize. You know, why do we teach our children about animals or about, another thing is palm trees. I showed some kid of a palm trees and a spruce tree. Not one kid could tell me that was a spruce tree. They'll, they'll say Christmas tree or, um, but they'll know what a palm tree looks like. But do we have palm trees around here? They'll never, probably some of these kids will never see a palm tree. So that's one way of decolonizing and in indigenizing is start showing our students not only the, the, the language, the names of their, the language of their species, but show them the species of um, their language, their animals. Okay, next slide. Uh, like right here, I, I have cards of, so what I did is I took a, a bunch of pictures. So a bear, muspa, you know, walleye, ugao, skunk, sigak, and then trust me that those kids will pick up that language, uh, beaver, amisk. And then, so you use those terms all the time. You'll say bear, muska. And then, um, so they'll, they'll start, you know, recognizing um, one of the kids. Okay, I'll tell you another one. Um, there's these, um, there's these two boys, they're a special ed, you know, academically behind. So they always come to my land-based my land based education program. So this one day, just recently, the, the spec ed teacher um, came and borrowed some because, uh, mitts and stuff because they were taking these uh, kids um, out on the land to cut wood. So, um, but prior to that, I had done uh, a few lessons on the beaver so that, that speck of those two boys come in here and then they says, hey, I seen a beaver today. And the speck of teacher goes, uh, are you sure that was a beaver? Yeah, it was a beaver. And he even pointed at the, at the picture. And then, so they see already there, that kid is recognizing the animal that just crossed the road or the coyote that comes hanging around here. So it's time we start decolonizing in the primary years and start teaching our kids what's native around their territory. territory. And in that chat, somebody said, even with trees, we only have three type of coniferous trees where I am, the black spruce, the white spruce, and um, the, the pine, you know? So start teaching and teaching those kids what type of trees or, or plants, another thing, plants, flowers, Next slide. So um, aquatic diversity. That's another thing I do is um, even, even the, the teachers, the teachers are really interested in my program because they're, they're learning along the way too. Like I said, a lot of our culture was learned, uh, lost, and um, our, um, the, our way, formal education is all we know. So I take kids, um, out like that picture where the kids are out on, with, with the chest waders, um, that is aquatic diversity, a, a lesson on a, um, aquatic di diversity. So um, what we do is we, we find ma macro invertebrates. And once those kids start to know, like I said, what's in our waters, they'll learn to take care of wa our waters. They'll learn not to pollute, they'll learn not to throw, they'll learn to take care of our waters. And also, but if we find a lot of macro invertebrates in our water systems, they are an indicator species that our waters are healthy. If there's no living macroorganisms in those waters, then 
something is happening with that water and it's not healthy and we should investigate. So um, our children, some of them, the children that I work with too, that's another thing, ocean. They know, they, if, if I showed them pictures of an ocean, of a lake and a river, the first thing that they, they'll know is the ocean. But they, we have a lake here, we have rivers everywhere. So that's another form of decolonizing and indigenizing is they'll never probably go to an ocean and, and, show, and so on. Okay, next slide. Grade three science, plants. I already talked about plants, so I'm gonna briefly go through this. So plant lesson, I take kids to go not only identify plants, but uh, pick medicinal plants. Um, we have picked um, spruce gum and we picked chaga and we pick rat root and then and then we prep it for medicine so that's that's um, indigenizing that instead of just talking about photosynthesis or or a sunflower or a rose or and so on and also um, with land-based education go out and plant go out and um, help out an elder with their with planting so I've um, we've planted trees and just recently the grade ones and the grade twos and the grade threes were learning about plants. Um, we, we actually grew tobacco. Um, so we actually grew tobacco. So that's a form of, um, and we know that tobacco is one of the sacred medicines with um, our Plains Creek culture here. So that's the way of indigenizing uh, that unit. And in grade three, in Saskatchewan, in grade three, you learn about plants. So um, you, you learn about plants, but don't let, with land-based education, I don't limit my students as to what they could learn. They're not gonna wait until their grade three, where it says in the curriculum that they have to learn about plants. It's all across, like the, the kindergartens, the grade ones, twos, threes, and so on. They all, I did, I just adapt my lessons and my units. They learn the same thing, and it's not just okay. And, and then in grade in grade nine, in grade six, you learn about plants again. It, it doesn't work that way with land based. Uh, next slide. So here it is. So here's the kids. They're 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 planting. Um, we started planting in the classroom. Eventually, what we're going to do is we're going to go outdoors and plant this tobacco. So we're just making little seedlings and the kids love it. You know, uh, uh, we had a big box of, of soil in, in our classroom. Um, big, and then that kid, when we were done planting, he goes, teacher, can I just play with this soil? And I said, yeah, by all means, go ahead. And I said, my mom never lets me play outside. And I'm like, really? You know, uh, you need, kids need to explore the outdoors to learn and connect with the land. Uh, next slide. So here we are, you know, kids are picking sage, uh, picking sweet grass, picking spruce. And uh, so that's learning about plants, the different types of trees that where we extract our, our um, gum from. Next one. I'm kind of speeding it up here because I see I'm gonna be running out of time. Native studies, grade 10 native studies. Unit one, identity and worldviews. Bring in again our kukums, our musums, come and teach our children uh, about their own identity. Who are they? By tying them back to their culture, that girl on the right there, she's actually a grade seven student. You know, we brought her in a few times to come and teach about her dance. We brought uh, who she is into our classroom. You know, in the, the middle picture there, we're listening to elders doing tippy teachings, teaching and, and about identity. And what I also did, uh, talk about treaties, you know, how do we, why are we treaty people? Do you know why you're treaty? Do you know why you, you have a treaty number? Do you know why you live on the reserve and other people don't? People, uh, our students need to know why they're treaty, why they have a treaty number and so on. You know, it, it's, it's about a part of understanding who you are. And uh, next slide. 
uh, earth and science, our solar system. Like I said, I was a science teacher for many years. I kind of got bored with teaching the, the solar system. No matter how I switched up my lessons, I was like, okay, I got to find a more engaging way of talking about the solar system. So we talk about Mother Earth. Uh, you could go to the next slide. So this guy here, I'm pretty sure you guys know who he is. His name is Wilt Wil uh, Wilfred Buck. I brought him to our to our school for two days, and he did. Um, I think he was here two days, one or two days anyway. But he did a school wide presentation to our students. Uh, head start all the way to grade twelve. He adapts his program, and he he teaches about. Um, not just planetarium in there, you could fit about 30 students in there. So he has the night sky, he has a projector and he manipulates the night sky and he talks about the constellations, but from an indigenous worldview. So that's, um, the, so that's Wilbur, Wilfred Buck. He's a very busy guy. If you want to book him, he's out of Winnipeg and um, you have to book him ahead of time. We couldn't get him for this culture camp. So we have to book him for September. But again, you know, teaching about the solar system, our indigenous ways of thinking, our epistemologies. Next one. And this one is, okay, if you go to the next slide, ecosystems, here's another good one. Go to the next slide. If we talk about um, interactions, interactions within ecosystems, so this is what this is a very good way of teaching about ecosystems, how important our ecosystems are. You could sit in the classroom and teach kids about ecosystems through a book, but you know, maybe the smarter ones will get something out of it. But what I do when I when we talk about um, habitats and ecosystems and interactions within ecosystems is I took these this grade out and then I gave them a picture of um, the forest food web, uh, the Plains Cree food web, you know, whether it's a coyote, it's an eagle, it's a snake, and so on. So they each had a picture. And then one kid went around with that, with that rope. Okay, what does an eagle eat? Well, it eats this, okay? And then what does a rabbit eat? Well, a rabbit eats this, and so on. Pretty soon they made a web, okay? And then we start talking about, okay, so what happens if all the eagles are gone? What happens if all the coyotes are gone? So those specific species, that one kid will drop that species and go aside. Then the next one, and then the next one, pretty, and pretty soon, uh, pretty soon all that rope is on the ground and the food web collapses. It's, we all depend on each other. Uh, every living thing has a purpose and we all depend on each other. So that is a good way of taking land, uh, indigenizing the curriculum and um, using land-based. So uh, next, next one. Okay, this is, I'm gonna briefly go through this. So in math, when I was teaching math for a number of years, and then I knew when the kids came, I started grade, I taught grade six, seven and eight, and the grade fives that came in, I knew what skills they lacked. A lot of teachers, and I, I was also a numeracy catalyst. So um, I know what teachers didn't teach. A lot of teachers would leave statistics especially geometry till the end of the school year. And then sometimes they don't get to it. Geometry is all around us. It's all around nature. It's, you know, um, take for example, the teepee, you know, that's, there's the big math and science lesson in just the shape of a teepee and, and so on. So um, the next few slides, I'm gonna, uh, how I taught um, indigenizing symmetry tessellations and angles. For those of you that are math teachers, you should be familiar with these concepts. So the next one, uh, if we talk about line of symmetry, if you see that moth, if you make a line of symmetry in the bottom, the one side of it is the mirror image of the other side. Same with the leaves. Even if you're looking at, if, even if you're looking at a clear lake and you look at the, the shore, and it, the reflection on the, on the water, the, all the trees, you know, that, that's a line of symmetry. Next one. And here we go again. If you put a line of symmetry on that bird, a few lines of symmetry on that, on that snowflake. 
Next. Uh, tessellations. Tessellations in nature, berries. Look at that honeycomb. Tessellations is when you have shapes that don't overlap. So that's the uh, um, nature showing us tessellations. Next one. Same thing, the back of a turtle. But talk about Turtle Island, our, our, our ground, the shapes there. Next one. The star blanket. Just one time I had a math class and I brought in the star blanket. And I told uh, the students, today we're going to learn about geometry. And they said, well, what's a blanket got to do with geometry? Oh, my goodness. We spent about two weeks on that blanket because we learned about the angles, the shapes, the patterns, the sequence, and so on. And we also had a traditional aspect of where a star blanket, the, uh, the teachings of a star blanket. So a star blanket itself, you could do a whole unit on it. Next slide. Uh, reach out to your local conservation officers. I, um, I bring in a, a conservation officer. We have a program called in Saskatchewan called Hothnod, hooked on fishing, not on drugs. He comes in, takes my students out, uh, forever kit. We have, uh, he comes in with a kit, forever kit it's called, all our native species on uh, fur bearing animals. He does a lesson, that's a lesson on there on his picture. We go to a model forest. You know, visit your national and provincial parks. A lot of those, because of truth and reconciliation, especially reconciliation, a lot of those uh, parks, uh, they make their, 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 um, their culture based. They have school programs that are culture based. Uh, look at historical sites, go to forts. You know, I take my kids to um, Fort Carlton, which is about an hour and a half from here, because that's where their great great grandfathers signed their Treaty Six. Uh, go to a trap land or a fish camp and so on. Next, a uh, couple more pictures of the conservation officer. Uh, next one. So other points, I'm kind of concluding now because I've been yapping for an hour, but other points to consider. Um, admin or teachers might not be supportive of land-based education as an informal way of learning and isn't measurable. Okay, sometimes teachers ask me from other communities, well, how do you assess your students? Like, really? If you're gonna start assessing and giving tests on students and giving them marks for land-based, then you're defeating the purpose of land-based because our, historically, our, our people, they didn't have assessment tool, tool, tools like that. So this is what I usually tell teachers. If that grade three students can tell me what plant that we're smudging with, where that plant could be found and why we smudge, that kid has 110%. If that kid can identify that tree, that birch tree out there and the three uses of that birch tree, 110%. So a lot of times uh, teachers will not support land base because there's no mark that goes into it. So uh, I, I don't mark my students that way. Students not engaged if not given a well-structured experience in order to be engaging. It has to be, there has to be an objective. Um, parents might not support land-based ed education if they themselves don't know what it is. Um, just wait there. So infrastructure, know what's around you, know where your lakes are. Is there a culture ground? Is there a, 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 a culture ground nearby? Is there a community nearby I can go visit? Is there a different culture? Like with us, we have uh, the Dakota is about 20 minutes from here. We have Woodland Cree half an hour from here and we're Plains Cree, so it's diverse, you know, know, know what's there. And your lakes, your, is there a historical circle? Is there, you know, and so on. So um, our students need to know our animal species. I already talked about that. They also need to know the land they, they come from, the, the, uh, the geography of their land. They need to know the history of their land because Sturgeon Lake wasn't just Sturgeon Lake. Sturgeon Lake came to be uh, for a reason. So you need to uh, teach your kids about the history of the land that they live on. Next slide. So with land-based education, the seven, the, the seven teachings, that your students will learn without even know, knowing that their learning is love, truth, honesty, courage, respect, and humility. Unbelievable how those kids 
learn those concepts without giving them a pen and a paper or giving them on a test. Next. So in closing, um, so in closing, research shows that learning in an outdoor environment has mental health benefits, improves understanding for active learners. It provides an opportunity for students to be good stewards of the land. Uh, in conclusion, and I'd like to stress this, land-based education learning has been here for thousands, tens of thousands of years. Indigenous people have always had STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. How do you think our people continue to thrive? It is our livelihood and a way to reclaim traditional ways of knowing. If we fail to include land-based education and culture, cultural knowledge into our existing mandated curriculum, then we are failing our great, great grandfathers who fought for Indian control over Indian education. It will say, hi, hi, I am done the PowerPoint. Wow. <laughs> Chi Miigwech for all that wonderful information and in from your entire presentation and the, and the way you uh, delivered the message. <clears throat> One word comes to mind to me and that is passionate. You are so passionate about the Indigenous uh, land-based learning curriculum. So thank you so much for that. I also want to acknowledge because we're running out of time in this session, uh, Carla, Pam, Sarah, and uh, Mary, they all had uh, wonderful points in the, in the chat room there with questions and comments. They basically say you're amazing and they would like to see more uh, land-based curriculum used in the classrooms to replace um, the, the primary um, curriculums that are out there. So thank you for that. And uh, Sarah, presentations will be available for later viewing. Uh, we just have to process it, record it, and then put it all together so you can come back to this uh, platform site and be able to click on and listen to uh, Tanya's presentation over and over and over again and make many notes. It's, it's uh, terrific. So Tanya, thank you so much for your, your time. And uh, we're gonna move on to our, oh, our word this time, our play to win code word is change. Like the changing environment, change is the uh, code word this time. So thank you so much for uh, participating in this one. And our next uh, presentation is community-based STEM curriculum. So we're gonna move on to that, take a quick break and we'll be back with more here in our land-based learning gathering. Miigwech.